Good morning, everyone. It's hard to believe we are down to the very last Sunday of the month of September. We're going to be in October next week, but we continue on in this Sermon on the Mount that we have been looking into. You know, whether we want to admit it or not, we like laws. Laws make sense. It helps us to know where we stand. It makes for a better society. And if we're honest, we would say that we, we like knowing, you know, that we are following a, a law or when we're not violating a law. But Jesus wants to take us even deeper. And while following a law can make us good citizens in a nation, Jesus is making citizens of a heavenly kingdom. It isn't enough to say that you haven't murdered someone. It isn't enough to say that you haven't committed adultery. Jesus says it's also sinful for you to be angry with someone and to hold resentment. That it's sinful to look upon someone other than your spouse with sexual intent. And following a rule, we learn, is just it's something that is, is easier. But allowing the Spirit of God to completely transform our heart to be like that of God can sometimes be a little more difficult. And today's text is no different. In fact, we're going to be reading the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 and 32. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Today, Jesus brings up this idea of divorce. And because we, we like following rules, often we go to this text and we are looking for the exception clause, which is really interesting when you think about everything that Jesus has been doing. He says, you know, you have heard this and, and, but he says, but I tell you, and he, and he's trying to take us deeper. And even last week, you know, we talked about lust and, and said, you know, you, he says, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. And the number one question that I've gotten about that text from last week is, is, well, if my husband watches porn, does that mean that I can divorce him because he's committed adultery and I can go find someone else? Or I've had people say, yes, I, I, I cheated on my spouse, but also know that they were watching pornography. So weren't they really the one who's the guilty party in this? They've already broken that covenant because we like rules. And again, they make sense to us, but Jesus is trying to take us even deeper. In our text, Jesus is dealing with a Jewish legal matter as it relates to last week's law of adultery, the seventh command. Now notice Jesus is speaking here in the text about this certificate of divorce. It is one of the laws of Moses that dealt, that talked about divorce and remarriage. It was a highly debated topic in the day of Jesus, and mainly because of this phrase, some indecency. And there were two schools of thought, and, and one of the Jewish schools of thought said that means sexual immorality only. And another Jewish school of thought said, no, that means anything that displeases the husband. The certificate of, of divorce, though, if you really do the study there in Deuteronomy 24, it's about protecting women in divorce who had no rights. And notice Jesus says that the man's wrongful action, it say, he says there, it makes her commit adultery. Jesus says that he bears the greatest amount of the guilt of what happens in that situation. And it makes a whole lot more sense when you go to Matthew chapter 19, which we're not going to go and get into all the in-depth, but Jesus is really going to unpack things there. And there Jesus says, listen, this whole certificate of divorce that he's mentioned here, it is because of the hardness of your hearts. Once again, we see an issue of the heart in Matthew 19, seven and eight. In other words, this is, Divorce is not the will of God. 
the, the Creator intended for marriage to be this permanent union, according to Genesis 2 and in verse 24, and divorce tears apart that union. It tears apart families. It distorts um, the, the very will of God for humanity and, and, and to bear the image of God that we've talked about over the last couple of weeks. Divorce is an outward result of an inward issue. Marriage is not just a contractual agreement that is regulated by law, but rather it is a good gift from God to humanity. This is a very sensitive subject, and I, and I realize that. Every congregation that I've ever served, every week, I preach to people out there who have been divorced. We all know people that we love and we care about deeply who've gone through this as well. This is not about making divorced people feel guilty. There are those who have had spouses who have uh, been abusive. There are those who have left them for someone else. And listen, you're the victim. You are the victim. I know there are those who have ended up in divorce because of their own sinfulness. They were the guilty party. They were the ones who, who did not take seriously this covenant that they had made. And every time this subject comes up, they just feel this tremendous amount of guilt. I want you to know, first of all, that God loves you. I want you to know that that God did not send his son to take your guilt and to drive it deeper and deeper, that what he desires is humility. He desires sorrow and repentance. And if you do those things and you are that person, then he will forgive you. Our God will forgive you. Those who need to feel guilty, are those who are unhappy in their marriage and they're just looking for a way out. They've stopped trying to be a good spouse. They maybe withhold sex with the hopes that, you know, maybe they'll find someone else and then they do and then, hey, it gives them a right to go out and remarry. I've even known those before who got separated or divorced and they were going to wait them out so that they would have a lawful purpose to divorce and then go out and, and find someone else. That is not God's intent for the marriage covenant. When we focus on exception clauses, we miss what Jesus is saying, and that is why we are focusing on the importance of marriage, because that is the will of God. According to the Witherspoon Institute, a lack of committed marriages and two-parent families is the root of many of today's social problems, particularly regarding child welfare. In 19, I mean, in 2003, the U.S. government established the Healthy Marriage Initiative that is to support marriages by enabling couples to gain the skills necessary for healthy marriages. Why do they do that? Because even the government realizes how important it is for a society. The Institute of Advanced Study of Religion says that marriage is the greatest social educator of children. It is the institution that most effectively teaches the civic virtues of honesty, loyalty, trust, self-sacrifice, personal responsibility, and even respect for others. The Institute for American Values found that children raised in intact families are more likely to attend college, are physically and emotionally healthier, are less likely to be physically and sexually abused, less likely to use drugs or alcohol and to commit delinquent behaviors, have a decreased risk of divorcing when they get married, are less likely to become pregnant or impregnate someone as a teenager, and are less likely to be raised in poverty. And we could give more and more stats on this stuff. And there's been lots of research that has shown that the creator, the one who made us, he understood that it's not good for man to be alone. What God says about marriage is right. So the things that we find in God's word that has to do with marriage is right. We should desire to follow those things. In fact, let's deal with a big one. Let's just blow it up from the beginning. 
And it's the one from Ephesians chapter 5, 22 and 23, where he says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Wow. And, and I know there's a lot of men out there, and you're like, yeah, amen, that's exactly right. And for some men, it's the only verse in the Bible they can even quote. And they do so because they want to use it to dominate. And that is not the intent. That is right the opposite. This is building upon principles that were leading up to this, including the verse right before it, where it speaks of mutual submission in chapter 5 and verse 21 that these are folks who are filled with the Holy Spirit. In verse 18, Paul is working within this framework of a male-dominated world to say that Christ is the ultimate authority. And the one who has the superior authority in that home is to treat his wife in a way that honors Christ. It is a model of love. It is a model of respect. And so in verse 25, he goes on, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And in verse 28 and 29, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. So here we see Christian marriages are meant to point beyond itself to God's work of redemption and, and unification. That is the kind of marriage that God wants us to have. So based on that, what does divorce point to? How does it honor Christ? How does it speak of Christ's work in the church? Hebrews 13, 4, he says, Let marriage be held in honor among all. So we see here, this is really important. And then he goes on, he says, And let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. As noted last week, sex is sacred, it's beautiful. When it is within that covenant bond, it is out of it that new life is created and made in the image of that very bond. And thus, we are living in the image of God and as, as God created us. Paul gives advice to the believers in Corinth. They were dealing with all kinds of sexual immorality. And he tells these couples there in 1 Corinthians 7 and verses 2 through 4, he says, listen, don't withhold from each other as, as a married couple, except for a time of prayer, so that you're not tempted, that something awful would come in and, and break that bond. The point I'm trying to make is that marriage is good. The Bible has always taught this. When God speaks of things, He speaks of it in this way. It comes from God. It isn't easy, but it is totally worth it. Some of you may not have a very good marriage, even despite you trying. The love that you once felt for each other has kind of subsided. Maybe you just feel like you simply exist in a home, but I have good news for you. And that is when you have two people who are willing to work on this marriage together, and it takes both, you can have a marriage that gains back the love that it once had. In fact, I've seen marriages who have come together and they have a greater love than the day that they stood there at the altar and they made their vows before God. I've, after you're married, there's a lot of things that can get in the way. People work on their jobs, and there's a lot of demands. Children can be involved, finances, difficulties. This is one of the reasons that Missy and I, we've always stressed for years in having a date night or date day sometimes. But we believe that unless there's there's way we just can't, 
we can't um, do otherwise that we're going to do this every week and have that time. We're going to talk every day, even if some days we don't have a lot of time to talk, that it's important that we have that communication. But we're not perfect. And we aggravate each other sometimes. We disagree on things. And you may find this hard to believe, but sometimes I'm hard to live with. You know, I can be messy. I'm not mechanically inclined. I'm not naturally romantic. I don't always make the best decisions, and I'm bald and overweight. But I have never, never felt that Missy didn't love me. There are things I've worked on over the years, whether it's being a workaholic or whether it's showing more affection or desiring or dealing with anxiety or using more tact or being more patient. We continue to work on things that make our marriage better, but we will tell you that we're still flawed. And yet, despite all those things, we love each other. We are there for each other. We protect each other. We have a faith in God that gets us through those difficult times. We talk about the future. We're honest, even when it isn't always easy. We readily forgive each other. We laugh and we share. We try not to embarrass each other in public. We try to live like Jesus, even though we'll tell you we fell at that. But we have a good marriage. And we believe it's worth it. It takes work, though. Before we close out, I want to talk to any teenagers, young adults, any adults we may have out there who are single and you have potential for getting married. One thing I want to tell you is that living together with someone is not God's design, and it does not produce that which is good. And this has been very popular for quite a long time, for years now, and they believe this is the best way to know if you should marry. But research will tell you, look it up, look at the research, look at the data, and it will show you that it doesn't do what they think it does. Having sex outside of marriage is not the way of God. It is not that you don't do that because you want to see if you have the right chemistry or you want to see if you're compatible because it flies in the face of Genesis chapters 1 and 2. This is not the definition of what God spoke of, of a helpmate. The beauty that of that um, intimate act, it comes from this bond that you have together emotionally and that even the older you get, and even though, you know, maybe you're not quite as physically attractive as you once were, you'll find that that intimacy is even greater than before. Anything that is based upon physical before marriage, you're going to be very disappointed in a matter of years. You don't base it on those things. Marriage is a sacred covenant relationship that goes all the way back to Eden. It, a man and a woman is united so closely that God says that these two become one flesh. In fact, in Matthew chapter 19, gen, uh, in verses 5 and 6, Jesus quotes from that Genesis passage, and he even says that God joins that union together. Take a little bit of time to think about that. The prophet Malachi critiqued God's people a hundred years after they had been brought back from exile. Turns out they're just as rotten as the people were before they went into exile. Many of the Israelite men, they were divorcing their wives for no good reason, and the people were okay with it. And so God had a message that he sent through Malachi. And so in Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, he says, You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? I mean, why is God not accepting this worship? And he says, because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? Think about that. You know, we often think the Spirit didn't come until, you know, Acts chapter 2. Listen, there were portions of the Spirit that was given before it was finally poured out, and one aspect was in marriage. And he says, and, was, and what was the one God seeking? 
godly offspring. So guard yourselves in the spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. God takes marriage seriously. And that is what I want to impress upon every single person out there this morning. A good marriage will either set you up for a lifetime of happiness or a lifetime of misery. Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 10, it's about the virtuous woman and it says, an excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. If you're looking for someone who already has precious jewels and you think that's what's going to make for a happy marriage, he says, that's just not the case. Find a spouse who loves the Lord. And what that also means is you must love the Lord. You're going to be amazed how far your faith in God is, is going to take you. Imagine being married to someone who lives by the words of Jesus, someone who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, who is merciful and pure in heart and a peacemaker, someone who doesn't allow their anger to linger or have sexual fantasies for someone else. A truly godly man or woman will treat you right. They will love you at your worst and they will celebrate you at your best. There is no such thing as a perfect spouse though and you need to understand that. But if you find someone who wants to live for Jesus and live like Jesus, you're going to find really what God wants for you to have in your life, especially as you continue to work on it. And guess what? You marry the kind of person that you date. And what I mean by that is don't, you, don't be enamored by simply dating by just feeling better about yourself that because someone wants to ask you out, listen, don't go out with anyone that you would not even ever consider marrying. And it doesn't mean you're going to marry that person, but it means you're not going to fall for someone who is less than what God wants you for you in your life. This section is about love and relationships. Love does not hold grudges as we saw couple of weeks ago. Last week we saw love is not predatory, and this week love is a covenant bond. And if you're out there and you're struggling in your marriage, please let us know. Let us know how we might can help you contact the ministers or elders or, or just some godly couples that you know right here in this church and sit down with them and talk with them because it is totally worth it. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for the blessings that you give us. Father, we thank you for the beauty of marriage. Father, just help us to continue to live the life that we should before you. And please, oh Father, just help our marriages in this church. Father, I pray that, that you will continue to watch over and to guide us. Father, give us uh, the desire to do the things that are necessary to, to live the kind of life that we should and to be of one flesh with our, with our spouse. And Father, we just pray that we will be a testimony to our world and a testimony to our children as they watch us uh, as we live together. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.